Well, now it's time for product, productizing clone. Uh, this talk is from Guido, Guido Steven. And uh, we are very glad to have you with us. Guido, thank you for being there. Uh, well, uh, that's all. Thank you. OK, there we go. Yeah, it's weird to do this talk uh, in my room at home uh, and not seeing uh, the community, not seeing the people that I'm doing the talk for and missing the context of uh, you know being together in the room. I think we we've lost Guido. Uh, doesn't seem to work. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, we're gonna try to fix it. Okay, you're back. All right, well, start again with transition. You're mute. Be careful. Still mute. Oh, sorry for that. Okay. Yes, I got a warning from Zoom about being live streamed and I didn't accept that in time. So I guess you missed okay. the introduction. Okay. Let's yeah, so just start over. It's okay. No problem. Okay. Let's do that again. Start. And then I need to share screen. Hang on. I need to find Zoom. Okay, I hope you can hear me now and uh, that Zoom is uh, proper, properly set up. Yeah, all good. You can go. Okay, let's go. My name is Guido Stevens. I'm the founder of Quave, and I will uh, talk you through how we evolved from a consultancy uh, driven uh, approach to Plone to the product uh, approach that we have in Quave. A uh, bit of an outline of this talk. I will give you a short tour of our design environment. Uh, I will go deeper into the problems that a consultancy approach uh, poses. Uh, with some live uh, war stories from the field. Um, I will go also go deeper into how we solve the tensions uh, there. And finally, uh, a bit of a summary on the remaining challenges that this uh, poses for actually making a viable business uh, out of that. Uh, first, a short tour of Quave. Uh, for those of you who already have seen it, uh, but also for those of you who haven't seen it, it's uh, useful as a context for this talk as well. Everything I'm showing you here is actually our design prototype. Uh, so Quave is a social uh, internet system, community system. We have a, a prominent social stream. We have a collection of apps. One of those is a calendar app. We have a news uh, magazine in Quave. There's a library. There's workspaces. Uh, workspaces people can self-manage who is a member of the workspace. They can then share and collaborate on documents, or in this case, even an email that came in. There's events, there's tasks, which you're seeing here in the workspace. And there's very powerful search, which is faceted, but which also has different variants optimized for different uh, view. And uh, yeah, I get you, Kim. <laughs> but uh, so this, these are profiles user profiles, and they are very deep. So that's just a very whirlwind tour of the feature set we have in Quave. And this is how it looks like now, but it's not where we came from. So back in the day, things were different. And where we came from is from a consultancy approach where we had big dreams and built uh, big sites. I'm in the wrong track on, uh, on Slack. Yeah, we, we built big projects 
And uh, we found out the hard way that one-off doesn't scale. So you can build uh, very nice solutions there, but in the end, uh, it, what the client wants is not what her users will need. Uh, so there's a big tension there between building something that's actually valuable. And also because it's one-off, uh, you, you get into maintenance hell. And the illustration is, I think, you know, it's typical for the challenges that you pose in a consultancy environment where you want to do the, your best for the customer, but the customer has some very clear ideas about how the solution should look like. And it's not necessary that these ideas are very optimal from either a user experience perspective or from a, uh, from a product architecture perspective. So to give an example of uh, how that pans out in, uh, in real problems is, uh, this is an, a screenshot from an early iteration of a legal app, which was used in a predecessor of Quave, uh, a big internet uh, solution. And the requirement for this was uh, discovered only just before launch. So Syslab had prepared this project and they were ready to launch this. And then just uh, three weeks before launch, uh, the customer comes and like, you know, we need to have the legal contracts in the database migration as well. And nobody had talked about that before that there were legal contracts. So, hey, what do you do as a consultancy shop in such a situation? You create a contact, contract object type, you know, a context, uh, a content type. You uh, build some filters to, uh, to that database. You know the drill, you just build that. And it's what we now call developer design. It's basically, you have the requirements and you whip up a fast solution uh, in uh, development. Because it was not budgeted that this needed to happen at all, that's a loss. Next uh, thing that happens is uh, a redesign of the project that comes in. Um, and this wasn't aligned with the rest of the project, so everything breaks here. And you show it to your designer, and he's like, what the hell is this? And then you need to fix uh, the UX problems, you need to fix the technical problems. Uh, basically, you need to re-implement all of that, 50% uh, of it, before it's really acceptable, and that's another loss. Then you think, okay, we made a loss, but now we have a nice legal app. Let's sell this to another customer. And we can uh, you know, recoup some of those losses by selling that at margin to our next uh, customer. However, the new customer has new requirements and the new customer doesn't like the old requirements of the old customer. So you have to build a new variant of the app for the new customer. But then the old client doesn't want the solutions that the new client wants. So you also have to maintain the old variant of the app. So basically you have to backport all the improvements you're making for the new customer to the old app. So now you have two apps and then there were two. The next th thing that happens then is that we have a generic toolbar redesign coming in, which affects like all of the pages in our system and not just the apps, everything in our system. And then, you know, normally that, you know, it's a lot of work anyway, but then the legal app is special. It doesn't conform to our design system. So bang, it breaks. And actually bang, it breaks twice. And now you need to upgrade two non-standard apps. And of course, and nobody's going to pay you for that because nobody said you should do it like this and nobody funded it like that. So after you know, years of this struggle, the conclusion is we cannot afford to do things cheaply. That's actually saying by Alex uh, Bill's uh, father, but it's quite applicable in this uh, scenario. So what to do instead? I call that a product state of mind. It's approaching it from a different angle. It's when interacting with clients, that's where it starts. It's like, you know, give me a problem, not a solution request. So typically customers, they ask for a button here or you know, they want to tweak there and they think they are helping you by putting it that way. And also they, they, they often like think in just in terms of very, you know, that's, that's the easy solution. That's the obvious solution. But it starts with saying no to solutioneering, saying no to a solution request. It's like, okay, tell me your problem and let's analyze that problem and let's generalize that problem. And it turns out that what the client wants is not exactly what her users need because it's our job 
to actually fully understand that field and to work with design and with requirements analysis and knowing the constraints of design, knowing the constraints of the technology, to find out what the proper solution is and to think uh, through all the edge cases. That's not our customer's job. Our customer's job is to understand the problem and to, to communicate that to us. So it basically means twisting the whole conversation away from feature requests and talking about user stories. And then in a later stage, when you have a design, and I will get to that, you can show you know, that it actually satisfies the problem. But first you have to understand the problem and you need to first do the design. Uh, in the left, you see a diagram and it's not really about design, but it is about the whole you know, like workflow of you know, going from a requirement to a, uh, a thing that is in production. And the earlier you detect a problem or a bug, and a bug can be a design bug or a requirement bug, you know, the, the later you detect that, the more costly it is. And I always say like, I've had a lot of customers who had uh, messy business processes uh, with inconsistencies. And if you just, you know, take those one off and translate those into code and into design, because it's inconsistent requirements, you end up with inconsistent code. Uh, we call that buggy code. So it's really like trying to move that detection as far up front as possible. And we do that by doing a lot of design and by taking a holistic picture in design. So our designer, he has this holistic view of the whole system. Um, and you cannot just do a like a local, locally optimized solution and not and then ignore the follow-up that has elsewhere. You need somebody who takes care, like, okay, if we change this, we're not consistent anymore with what's happening there. And we need to solve all of that at once. We do that in what we call Proto, which is our design environment. It's our front-end only system, which does not have any blown backend at that stage. It allows us to fail fast and it allows us to actually do proactive design where we design features uh, and we can actually show them to clients before we even actually build the system. We just have the design. And I think a lot of this comes down also to a misconception about what design is. So design is not, it's, People see the beauty in the design and they think it's about the colors and how, you know, how, how the rounded borders are set up. But that's actually not why it's beautiful. It's beautiful because design is not what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works. That's a quote from Steve Jobs. And if you really get to the, to, you know, in depth into how it actually should work, what you then get is a work of art that in the way it functions and, you know, in the interactions that it offers, it just feels sane, it feels nice, it feels smooth. And that's the function of design. You still need to then sell that, and how do you do that? So you then have this generalized design and you work with your clients to come up with a generalized design. And it's presented here on the slide in a linear fashion, like find generic product value and solve this client's needs with the generic solution. But it's actually, of course, it's iterative. You, you come up with a generic, you know, an abstraction of what the client wants in a way that it can serve all clients. And you validate that with this specific client that the generic solution is actually fine for their need. The way we do find generic product value is by aligning with product-wide affordances. So that's stuff like the social feeds we have, we have workspaces, we have bookmarks, we have workflows, we have user profiles, we have search. So those are all you know, generic affordances that are product wide and you can mix those in new shapes to come up with new solutions for clients. And that basically means, <coughs> sorry, that means extending uh, solution patterns that we have in such a way that they embrace this new emerging requirement. And if needed, we can also add a generalized app if that uh, new requirement is so new that it doesn't really fit within uh, any of the existing uh, applications we have. Like I said, you then solve the client's need with the generic solution. And it may be that you then need to parameterize configuration if needed. So you make like a small twist of the generic solution. And the key is to not make that a client specific design. It's more like we recognize that this product can be used in multiple ways. One of which is optimal for this client, but it will be useful for other clients as well. And it's still like a variant of the overall thing. It's a, it's a configuration, it's not a fork. And then finally, you ship an MVP. You ship a minimally viable product. Um, if you want to do it right and build a good product, uh, there's no way that on for a single customer, you can ship a, a kick-ass feature that is fully worked out 
unless the client has a lot of budget and needs it really hard, but else you, you will need to amortize that over a longer time. You need to build something that is good now that delivers 80% of the value for 20% of the effort, which is the Pareto rule. And then later you can return to that if this, and, and also that's actually good because then this client gets to give it to their users. The users get to experiment with that. They get feedback on that. And then all the initial ideas you have about how they should be evolved, they actually become grounded. They become changed by the practice. And then you can build the extension later informed by actual usage patterns that you're seeing and actual requirements that people articulate. So what that boils, boils down to is that you should build half a product, not a half ass product. And this is Jason Fried from 37 Signals. And I like that approach. It's like, instead of building something uh, that, that is fully functional, but you know is weird, it's better to build something that is really slick and has a lot of potential to grow into the future, even if it's not fully realized yet, it's still already useful. What it gives you, if you manage to have that balance uh, and, and get it right, is that you reach a point where you can experience scale and synergy. So our deployments are QA tested product wide, which means that uh, if we do a deployment of a product and we, we talk about it like a product, it's like roll out to all our customers. We, we don't have to test the whole product for all our customers. We can just test our product. And then we make a few checks that you know the, the themes for the, these customers are still working, but the functionality and all the core interactions, they are just in the product. And if they work in one theme, they will work in the other themes as well. It also means that we can have automated upgrades. So we can just script uh, a new, uh, a new uh, point release and it goes out. And, like, and that then also translates into fully scripted deployment. So the upgrades are scripted, the deployments are scripted as well. On the business side, in terms of maintenance and extensions, it means that we, we deal with this in a subscription manner. Our clients uh, pay us for subscriptions and we are, we are able to, to handle all of the effort that it, it takes to increase the quality of the product as a whole for all our customers. Well, we, we share the cost of that across our customers. It allows a potential for cross sell So multiple customers, they want the same feature. Well, we can pull that money and build a better variety of that feature. It also allows for upsell, like we, we sold a feature to one client and we made a, a basically a lossy investment on that, thinking that we can sell it to another client and actually we can. And then we, again, we can build a high quality product that way without necessarily billing everything to a single customer. That's not all rosy. It still leaves uh, some prominent challenges in product space, which uh, I will go into for clients, for developers and for the business side. Clients is the key here. And the approach here is to nip it in the bud, which means no one-off customizations. I Googled for an image for the kitchen sink. I thought this is quite appropriate. If you follow the lead of that one client that you're currently working with, you will end up building a kitchen sink like that in the shape of a guitar. Because this client has a guitar. He wants to wash his guitar. He also wants to wash his hands. This is the optimal solution for this client. Of course, we all understand that the next client who maybe doesn't have a guitar, they may have something else, you know, it doesn't fit. So instead you, you design a solution that, you know, allows this client to wash their guitar without giving a guitar shaped wash basin to everybody. And the solution pattern, like I hinted at as before, is that we have configuration as design product variation. So it's not that we hack the system for a specific client, it's that we actually in the design phase integrated the requirements for this client in such a way that they will be satisfied with the product. And an example of this approach is that the customer brands we have are themes, they are not software. So they are CSS only. Let me just quickly show you how that works. So this is uh, one theme. This is not a client. This is not a client. It's the same product, just uh, styled differently. On the developer side, it means that we as developers have to submit to the paradigm of design first, which means if it's not in Proto, if it's not in our design system, it does not exist. That's really hard. As a developer, you see something that isn't fully worked out, you want to fix that. But you know, we, we don't do that. We we well, we try not to do developer design. And the solution pattern here is that we do design calls and design reviews with the designer. 
And a nice example is, for example, we recently did a project for our 500 error pages. Now, if you see this design in the left pane as a developer, you see the support thing being underlinked and you think, oh, that's a mail tool and it will point to the registry record for the maintainer email address because you know how Plum works and that's the obvious implementation. So I put that to the designer. He says, no, no, not a mail to link. There should be link to a help page, a support page. And I'm like, oh, but we don't have the support page. And he's like, yeah, yeah, it is there. It's in the admin app. And then, oh, we didn't build that admin app yet. So you have to go back there and then negotiate whether you can start off with a mail to link. But still, we then need to buy into the full vision of having the full solution for all of that there, and then working in, in development and engineering, working towards the design vision. So design is in the lead, and then we follow and, and build it like that. On the business side, that results in technical debt, uh, which is unavoidable. We try to keep dev in sync with Proto, so we try to keep the blown system in sync with the design system that we have. But because design is in the lead, we are by definition, we are behind. Uh, on top of that, we have ongoing maintenance because we need to ship. We do make compromises while we're shipping and then they come back and we need to return to that and improve that code uh, bit by bit. And the solution pattern here is also to do proactive design. So to actually to invest more in the design and then to sell those solutions to clients, but also to make sure that design in design, everything has been flashed out in such a way that once, once we get around to fixing stuff on the development side, we actually do it in a way that moves it close, closer to the uh, articulated vision and design. And an example for that is the admin app, which is the design here. Uh, we don't actually have this uh, yet. So while well, we, we have the functionality of having external apps, we currently configure those in Barcelona Ata, so in raw plum. Uh, that's of course not acceptable from a UI perspective. You know, Barcelona is not part of our UI, it's, it's like a workaround. So then we have an articulation of like, okay, so once we want to build this properly, we know how to do it. If you don't work that way and don't manage your technical debt, you will end up with newspaper articles like the one I'm quoting here, the piece in The Guardian, which which is actually quite a nice piece about uh, technical debt. And they say like, so why did Blue Origin you know, fall behind to SpaceX? And their conclusion is it's an immense amount of technical debt defined as engineering challenges that build up as a result of choosing a quick solution rather than the best solution, which I think is quite appropriate. Uh, and and it's, so this is something that can kill your company if you don't uh, take care. So to wrap this up, there's a tension between customer intimacy or product excellence, traditionally in management speak, but you actually need both. You need to work really closely with your customers without being captured by their requirements or by their solution here. And you need to then realize an excellent product that they are satisfied with, but that you can also sell to other customers. Should you do this in an agile uh, fashion, gradually incremental or do holistic design? And actually you need to do both. You need to work ahead in design and still you need to be very flexible, uh, both in code, but also in the design, it also needs to evolve. How do you handle technical debt? Well, it's unavoidable. You just need to manage it and you need to constantly keep investing in, in uh, reducing technical debt because each time you're also incurring more technical debt. And to finish this off, while I was preparing this talk, I saw this uh, stuff on Twitter. It's like you know somebody quoting a product leader from a well-known company. And the product leader says, you know, honestly, sometimes I want to go back to my old job, which was more project oriented, more feature factory. Because people underestimate how hard this is, you know, this design, this product driven approach. And then this guy answers like, you know, well, he, he would like to go back to the feature factory because he would be on the giving end and not on the receiving end. And I thought that was quite funny because, you know, it's nice to build new features. It's perhaps less nice to be a user of such features if they're not fully well developed. And it's certainly not nice to be the guy in the back room who has to maintain those old features that somebody else built. That was my talk. Well, thank you very much. It was a very good talk, very interesting.